Oscar. Thank you, Emilia. Uh, good evening to everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to, to tonight's lectures titled The Conflict in Western Sahara at Crossroads. Uh, we would like first to, to say thank you to Ambassador Mr. Bashir, representative of the Polisario Front to the European Union. Uh, Dr. Ubi Bashir is also a member of the National Secretariat of the Polisario Front. And he has also served as the Sahrawi representative to the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, and South Africa, among other positions. Uh, tonight, he will share with us a first-hand analysis of the situation of the conflict, and more in particular, the challenges uh, the Sahrawi people are facing for the past few months. So um, if any question, please uh, feel free to write them uh, in the chat. We will have a, a brief period of question and answers when the presentation has finished. And uh, now without further delay, Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much. The, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for, uh, for the occasion. And in, fa and in fact, we really commend the Dutch uh, uh, National uh, Students Association in, Groning in Groningen for the organization of this event. And of course, your interest in the plight of our people and the conflict around our country in, in, in Western Sahara. So we are really very glad to see, uh, though the conflict is really a very low profile conflict, yet some uh, uh, students uh, from like, like the Netherlands are really interested in the plight uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the conflict in our, in our country. I will try to make my presentation around three uh, basic uh, parts. The first one will be to share with you some of the basic founding facts around the conflict in Western Sahara. And the second part will be around a sort of summary of the history of the conflict in Western Sahara on the basis of what, what I would call uh, plans, the Moroccan plans versus the Sahrawi uh, reactions or resistance. And then the third part will be uh, the current situation and, the, and some perspectives and conclusions. On the first part, uh, uh, related to the basic founding facts around the conflict, the first one, the first element for me would be the fact that uh, Western Sahara is considered to be the only and last colony in Africa. In fact, among those 17 territories on the list of the fourth committee of the UN, the UN General Assembly, the Western Sahara is the only African territory. That's why it's referred to within the African Union and worldwide as the last African colony. The second element is the fact that uh, Morocco who is claiming some, some uh, rights over Western Sahara, according to the international law has no any sort of sovereignty over the territory of Western Sahara is considered by the United Nations as an occupying power of the territory. And that is according to the UN General Assembly Resolution 3437 in 1979, but also 1980 and so on. The two territories, the Western Sahara and Morocco are distinct and separated territories according to the ruling of the European Court of Justice uh, 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 of 2016. Uh, the third element is the fact that the Frente Polisario that I'm representing, that I'm representing for the European Union and Europe is the uh, um, only legitimate uh, and official representative of the people of Western Sahara. And that's also according to the UN General Assembly Resolution 3437, among others, but also according to the paragraph 105 
of the EU uh, Court of Justice ruling in 2016. The fourth element of those um, basic facts is um, in relation with the right of self-determination of the people of Western Sahara that will remain the ultimate and final objective of any political process aiming at settling the conflict in, 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 in Western Sahara. And the fifth element is the fact that uh, uh, Morocco, which is the occupying power of Western Sahara, is in fact uh, the only country in the world that doesn't have any final ratified borders with any of its neighbors. It's an occupying uh, power in Western Sahara, still has some historic claims that come regularly on the narratives and the political declaration, declarations by some politicians in Morocco over Mauritania. It has no rati finally ratified borders with, with, uh, with, uh, with Algeria, and uh, it has a very big potential in terms of dispute with, uh, with Spain over Ceuta Melilla and the delimitation of waters around the Canary uh, Islands. So those are basically uh, uh, the very um, basic uh, uh, elements and, and, and facts that I wanted to share with you just to have a, 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 a general view on the, on the uh, sorry, let me off this. Uh, Uh, on the second part of the presentation uh, about the history of the conflict, I'm not going to go back on in history on, on details, but I uh, sometimes summarize the history of the conflict in three parts. Uh, the first one is what I call it that Morocco, when Morocco decided to occupy uh, Western Sahara, the first plan that was uh, uh, elaborated by Morocco. The plan A was the acquisition of Western Sahara by military means. That was the plan A. And that was reflected in the de famous declaration of the King Hassan, the late King ha uh, Hassan II, when he said that it will be just a week of journey around Western Sahara by the end of which I will extend my authority over the territory. And we know that the, the, the bombardments and the military intervention in the territory and the military occupation of the territory in 1975 and the, all the repressions uh, that were committed by Morocco against the Sahrawis by then. Morocco has a, a plan A, which was military occupying Western Sahara and extending the sovereignties, thinking that the Sahrawis nomadic people, very few people wouldn't really have the strength to resist that occupation. But uh, the Sahrawis, led by the Polisario Front, that was the movement of liberation in place since uh, three years almost, that had already started the military struggle against the Spanish uh, uh, colonization, led uh, a, a fierce uh, resistance to the Moroccan uh, to the Moroccan occupation and uh, uh, succeeded even in uh, um, fighting the Moroccan army inside the Moroccan uh, uh, territory, inside the Moroccan internationally recognized uh, border. And Morocco couldn't afford the resistance by then and, and then resorted to the, to the construction of the military wall that you know all, that is separating Western Sahara from the north to the, to the south, very well fortified wall with mines, anti-persons and anti-tanks, fences, radars, and all of that. That was a proof of the, the difficulties that the Morocco, that Morocco has to face the, uh, 
the rapid um, the rapid and the effective manner in which the Sahrawi uh, units, the guerrilla warfare that was um, that was adopted by the Polisario in terms of atta attacking the Moroccan uh, forces in Western Sahara. So Morocco uh, by 1990 was obliged to pay around almost on a daily basis around 10 millions of dollars. That was the bill of maintaining the war in Western Sahara. And it was something almost out of reach, something impossible really to sustain anymore for Morocco. That's why this, they decided to recognize the right of the people of Western Sahara to self-determination and enter in political process that uh, was um, to lead to the organization of the referendum of self-determination, the uh, ratification of the ceasefire agreement between the two parties the Polisario Front and Morocco under the auspices of the UN and the uh, uh, deployment of a UN permanent UN mission to monitor the ceasefire in, 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 in uh, uh, and but at the same time to organize the referendum of self-determination. So that was the plan A for Morocco was to, uh, was the military plan. That was the first option for Morocco, but it failed in 1990. So they had to, uh, 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 to shift to the plan B. Uh, and the plan B was to, uh, to uh, um, extend the, so, or to have the, uh, the sovereignty over Western Sahara recognized by the international community by uh, uh, a sort of uh, uh, rigged referendum of self-determination getting the UN involved, but once the UN and the ceasefire is granted, so uh, an effort to, to get, uh, to falsify the referendum and to rig it and to get the UN personnel involved in that. And I want you to really, and I really rec re recommend highly that you read a testimony of Frank Rudy, who used to be a, 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 an American ambassador and who was the chair of the committee of identification. Of the, of the MINURSU, of the UN mission in the territory, a testimony that was presented in front of the Congress, the Foreign Affairs Committee in 1994, where he was explaining how Morocco uh, was trying to bribe everybody to uh, get the, uh, to rig the referendum of self-determination. But by the publication of the, of the list of the voters in, in, in 2000, uh, where it was very clear for Morocco and for, for everybody that a referendum of self-determination organized on the basis of that list will lead uh, uh, certainly to the, uh, to the independence of the territory. That's where Morocco started also thinking of a plan C instead of getting a referendum of get, getting a referendum rigged because the UN mission was not really uh, uh, cooperative in the sense that Morocco wanted, and also the system that was put in place prevented Morocco from getting that uh, objective. So once the list, provisional list was published, Morocco got the final proof that winning a referendum is almost impossible. So they activated the plan C. And that was, I mean, the plan B was since 1991, the ceasefire and the deployment of the MINURSO until 2005. The plan C was from 2005 until last year, 2020. And the plan C, in fact, of course, the plan B and the will to get a referendum, the final um, declaration of the end of this plan were when the king uh, declared officially that uh, Morocco will not will never cooperate in any way that will lead to the organization of a referendum of self-determination in Western Sahara. It will, this was a, a, a formal recognition of the failure of plan, uh, of, la, of plan B that was aiming at bringing the referendum of self-determination. Uh, the plan C from 2005 until last year consisted basically in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, putting as much as possible of obstacles uh, uh, in front of the UN uh, efforts 
to settle the conflict in Western Sahara and not being cooperative and uh, making all sorts of problems to the UN mission uh, uh, on ground that would generate a sort of diplomatic fatigue by the end of which the international community would uh, either abandon the efforts or uh, seize the opportunity of the Moroccan plan uh, as uh, as as a sort of uh, uh, a way to settle uh, to settle the conflict but uh, by the end of 2019 especially 2018 and 2019 the mediation of Kohler, the former german ambassador there was um, there was uh, there was a, a sort of um, a serious effort to settle the conflict on the basis of a very clear road map which was the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the right of the people of Western Sahara to self-determination and the international law in, 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 uh, uh, and the implementation of the, of the international law and the international legality. Uh, and from there, Morocco started really uh, uh, having also the, fa the, 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 the feeling that uh, the, the, uh, the autonomy plan that was presented to the UN Security Council since 2007 didn't succeed to be adopted by the parties, uh, failed. So that's why we saw the, uh, the Moroccan um, uh, unilateral uh, decisions to expel some uh, the civilian component of the MINURSU in 2016, the uh, AU, the African Union Com component office in the, in the, that was attached to the MINURSU in the same year. Also the, uh, the, um, the attempts to, to pave the road around the area of Gergarat in 2017. Some efforts that gave the impression that Morocco wanted to uh, uh, activate uh, Plan D, which was uh, U-turn to the zero uh, to the square zero and the resumption of the military host hostilities and that was exactly what occurred last November on the on the on the 13th because you would remember that 13th of November uh, uh, after three weeks of uh, peaceful demonstrations by some Sahrawi activists the Moroccan army decided to to invade that party which is on the extreme south west of uh, western sahara outside the burn uh, 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 occupying a new part of western sahara and extending the military wall exactly to touch on almost the border with uh, with uh, with mauritania and since then for us it was uh, uh, a very clear violation of the terms of the ceasefire and uh, we had no we have been left with no choice but declaring the resumption of the armed struggle against the Moroccan occupation. And that's where we are until now. Military confrontation between the Polisario troops on a daily basis along the military wall that was uh, constructed by Morocco to divide the territory in two parts. Uh, uh, this is exa and at the same time, some Moroccan campaigns on the human rights activists to, to uh, the intensification of the campaign against the human rights activists in the occupied part of Western Sahara. So that was basically a summary of the history of the conflict since 1975 until, uh, until now. The third part of my intervention is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is on the current situation and the perspectives ahead. Uh, the reality now on ground, there is, uh, uh, um, we have resumed the armed struggle against the Moroccan army after 30 years of a ceasefire that was ratified between the two parties in 1991 as one of the elements among the, uh, a complete package that was uh, going to lead to the refer to the organization of the referendum of self determination. The referendum of self determination was rejected by Morocco formally in 2005, and we have been left practically only with the ceasefire as the only element that was 
uh, that was still in place from that uh, from that uh, peace uh, peace plan. And when Morocco decided to attack on the demonstrators in November last year, we decided to respond adequately. And we, uh, 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 since then, we uh, have decided that we are disengaged from the ceasefire and we uh, 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 undertake on a daily basis attacks on the Moroccan units uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Western, in Western Sahara. Um, and I would like to make a, a sort of special emphasis on the issue of the ceasefire, because uh, in my meetings with uh, European diplomats and people would, of course, the war is the worst option for 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 uh, for everybody, and uh, and uh, we have tried for thirty years to avoid exactly this outcome. But seems that uh, the Security Council and the international community in general um, didn't really want to uh, exercise uh, the pressure that was needed on Morocco to uh, implement the agreement that we signed together, which is the referendum of uh, self-determination. So the Everybody, I mean, some of the people are asking us to go back to the political process. But uh, since Morocco re rejected the referendum of self-determination in 2005, there was not any political process in, 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 uh, going on. So all what was left is the ceasefire. And the ceasefire, we got the impression, especially during the last years, that it was um, just a way to to, uh, to maintain the state quo of the Moroccan occupation of our territory. As if we have been asked, especially this, the, the, the armed wing of the Polisario Front, the fighters of the Polisario Front that were deployed along the liberated area of Western Sahara on, on, the, on the eastern side of the, of the burg, as if they have been asked to, 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 to remain um, guards for the occupation of their own country, because the referendum was not there. And even inside the Security Council, we, we have started getting the feeling that there was, uh, there was a gradual abandon of the referendum of self-determination as an idea to accommodate uh, a sort of uh, some of the Moroccan uh, proposals like um, political uh, solution mutually acceptable that would lead to the self-determination of the people of Western Sahara. And if the referendum was uh, in a way, uh, in a way uh, sidelined, especially, uh, especially with the last UN Security Council uh, resolution. So yet Morocco also decided in, in last, uh, last year to violate the terms of the ceasefire and uh, occupy that new part of the of the of the territory. So we have been left with no choice but resuming the armed struggle, unfortunately, and we, knowing that it is really a bad choice for for uh, for for everybody. So that is the situation on ground now. But at the same time, on the occupied part of Western Sahara, there is a huge campaign of. The intensification of violations of human rights of the people, of the civilians under the Moroccan occupation, house arrests, uh, uh, tortures, uh, uh, huge siege on the on the territory of Western Sahara, and some appeals have been uh, have been uh, uh, published by uh, like Amnesty International, especially on the case of the human rights defender Sultana Khaya, who is under arrest. Uh, now for almost uh, uh, two or three or three uh, or three uh, months. So it's a sort of uh, revenge by the Moroccan authority, uh, authorities on the civilians under the occupation. Morocco, of course, is denying the uh, the uh, the um, uh, Morocco is denying the war. I'm pretending that there is no war now in Western Sahara. And all what the Polisario Front is declaring, de de declaring just some media 
campaign that has no effect on on ground this is not the first time that morocco denies uh, such thing because in 1975 they denied even the existence of the polisari front and they kept on denying the existence of the pws prisoners of war that they were captured by the sahrawi army the moroccan uh, uh, prisoners of war that they were captured by the Sahrawi army from 1975 to 1991. They refused to recognize them. They refused uh, the uh, the mediation of the uh, um, uh, ICRC to hand them over, a part of them, to Morocco uh, almost for six years. So it's not uh, something new. But at the same time, we think that now they still have the, the illusion, Morocco still have the illusion that uh, by denying the existence of the war, uh, a huge room is still left that we may come back to the, to the state school that was existing prior to the, prior to the collapse of the, of, the, of the ceasefire. And that maybe a nomination of new uh, special envoy would just reactivate the same passive uh, spirit of the UN almost being there but doing uh, doing uh, doing nothing. Uh, Morocco is uh, especially on a regional dimension. Uh, we may say that is isolated because the 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 the, the uh, two countries uh, that are surrounding Western Sahara and Morocco are Mauritania a country that recognizes the Sahrawi people, that recognizes the Sahrawi Republic that was proclaimed in 1975 by, 1976 by the Polisario Front, uh, and Algeria, which is also one of the most uh, uh, firm allies of the Polisario Front and of the Sahrawi people. So regionally speaking, Morocco is, is, uh, is isolated by the fact that the two surrounding countries are very much in support of the Sahrawi uh, uh, struggle. On the continental level, you would also recall that in, in, in Morocco was expelled or withdrew from the Organization of African Unity in 1984 to protest against the admission of the Sahrawi Republic by then, and uh, was out, outside the African Union until 2017, 2017 where it was readmitted, uh, 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 readmitted again, and thought that by that from within, Morocco can influence the position of the African Union and can have an impact on that role that the African Union was trying to do in terms of support of the people of Western Sahara and the insistence that the UN should speed up the uh, process. But uh, just uh, Two weeks ago, the AU Peace and Security Council organized a summit that was dedicated exclusively to the issue of Western Sahara. And you know that uh, within the African Union, there is a council um, for peace and security, 15 members from the African Union uh, uh, countries are sieging in that on a, on, on a, a rotative basis, are sieging in that uh, in that in that council, so this one, this council, which is the supreme organ within the African Union, especially in term in, in issues related to peace and security in Africa, decided uh, last week uh, by unanimity uh, on a decision that was very much in support of the of the people of Western Sahara and the right of self-determination, insisting on the, that the dispute between the two member states, the Sahara Republic and Morocco, should be resolved on the basis of the strict respect of the fourth article of the Constitutive Act of the African Union. And the fourth article of the Constitutive Act of the African Union stipulates very clearly that there is a need to respect the boundaries inherited from the colonial era, which means that uh, uh, clear recognition of the borders uh, uh, internationally recognized between Western Sahara uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Morocco. Of course, in addition to uh, uh, some, uh, some decisions 
to reinforce the, the African Union role with the UN to, to, to settle the conflict, which is against the Moroccan position that wanted the African Union to be totally absent from any uh, from any role uh, within the within the political uh, political process the immediate reaction of morocco was that they are not concerned by this communique and that they wouldn't cooperate in that sense and for them it's exactly a non event the same way that the apartheid was dealing with the organization of the african union uh, of the organization of the african unity decisions in the 80s and the and the and the 70s on europe of course the dominating country in terms of the foreign policy you know that it is france one of the firm allies of morocco on this uh, on this issue but europe collectively uh, decided to refuse the uh, trump unilateral proclamation on western sahara because trump uh, in December last year, decided unilaterally to recognize the Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara. That move was rejected by the whole of the European countries, including, including France, and all of the European countries insisted on the nature of the conflict, the right of self-determination, and the UN as the avenue to, to, to settle the conflict in Western Sahara. Uh, on the natural resources, and this is where Europe has uh, has uh, has uh, a central meaning within the general uh, view on the conflict in Western Sahara. The European General Court, uh, the, the beginning on on the second and the third of March, uh, uh, organized a public audience to deal with the appeals that they have been introduced by the Polisario Front against the, against the, um, against the European, uh, uh, the Council of the European Union decision to uh, ratify some agreements with Morocco that they include uh, Western Sahara ex against the uh, rulings of the European Court of Justice in 2016 and 2018 that I was referring to earlier on, that they stated that Morocco and Western Sahara are uh, two separated and distinct territories, and that mm, the uh, uh, exploitation of the natural, natural resources of the territory should be done uh, uh, exclusively uh, after getting the consent of the people of Western Sahara. So the Council of the European Union proceeded to the ratification of those economic uh, agreements with Morocco without uh, respecting the decisions of the, the rulings of the European uh, Court of, of, of Justice. And we are expecting a new ruling uh, by the beginning of summer of this year that would uh, hopefully uh, uh, reinforce exactly the same spirit of decisions that were 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 decided in 2016 and 2018. On the UN, um, uh, there is a saying in Spanish. I don't know how it's if it is if it is possible to be. Uh, I mean, it's shining with its absence. Brilla por su, su, su ausencia. So no practically, practically no presence now of the UN, no um, no uh, firm efforts to reconsider the situation and to be present uh, practically effectively between the parties now to to mediate. Talks about an eventual appointment of a new special envoy of the uh, of the un secretary general we don't really know how far the un is is with that uh, with that uh, with that uh, ass assignment anyhow our position as the polisario front is that uh, uh, we are of course we would remain of course ready all the time to engage in direct negotiations with morocco this time around negotiations may not mean necessarily that we go back to the old uh, agreement of the ceasefire 
that is one thing. And the first thing uh, uh, we think that for the UN, before proceeding to the nomination of new special envoy in Western Sahara, there must be an effort by the Security Council or the General Secretary of the UN or both of them at the same time to determine the framework of the mandate of the new special envoy. Because if he's just appointed within the actual context, he will be condemned to failure, exactly as, the, as, as all the predecessors. So there is a need to determine the, 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 um, the framework, the new framework of, of his mission before proceeding to his or her uh, uh, eventual uh, nomination. The third element on the framework we think that should include clearly the final objective of the process, which should be the referendum of uh, uh, self-determination. Morocco is insisting on the, on the autonomy as under the Moroccan sovereignty as a formula to settle the conflict in Western Sahara. And we think that it is, of course, in contradiction with the international law, in contradiction with the right of, uh, of, 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 uh, of self-determination. But also, Morocco is not, is not serious about anything that would, uh, would, uh, would, uh, that would, uh, would present. And that Morocco on its own wouldn't go for any solution, whatsoever solution, unless there is an obligation from the UN Security Council to do so. There is a need to upgrade the conflict from the chapter six to the chapter uh, seven. Otherwise, Morocco on its own wouldn't really uh, uh, cooperate with any, uh, with any solution. Uh, inside the Moroccan system, the issue of Western Sahara has been perceived throughout history as a source of legitimacy of the system in place, and maybe also a way to secure a sort of balance between the three major actors in the political life in Morocco, which is the, the monarchy, the, uh, the army, and the political class. Because in 19 the beginning of the 70s, you would recall that many successive military coups were going on in Morocco the the uh, the military coups were reflected a sort of deficit of the legitimacy of the system in place that was reflected in those either in contestation social contestation or or military coups the king invented the story of western sahara exactly to get rid of the army and to gain this sort of source of legitimacy and national cause to unify Moroccans over, over this. And I don't think that Morocco on its own would afford of uh, 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 going to any uh, solution that would abide by the international uh, legality and international law norms if there is no, uh, if there is no uh, uh, step taken a decision, a firm decision taken by the UN Security Council to, 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 uh, to, 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 to oblige them uh, to do so. We have spent 30 years as Sahrawis waiting just for a single day of democracy, that we will be granted just one day to vote. 30 years, only one day to vote. And the international community was not able to give us that promise of one day. As a Polisario Front, we are the movement of liberation that represents the Sahrawi people. And but we said it very clearly since the beginning that our historic mission, our historic role, ends exactly at the point where our people will be granted their right to self-determination. And then it's up to the Sahrawis to decide. The Sahrawis may decide. Our wish is that the Sahrawis decide for the independence. But if they decide otherwise, we would accept it. We have no problem with that. 
and we will assume the consequences of that genuine and democratic choice of our of our people. We made so many concessions throughout those last 30 years. We started with the, the option of a referendum with only with the referendum only with two options, either the independence or the integration with, with, with inside Morocco. With a, with a census which was exclusively on the basis of the Spanish census of, 1970, uh, of 1974. We ended up ac ac accepting to to um, to enlarge the the criterion to identify the Sahrawi people to accommodate some of the Moroccan uh, demands and to allow a part of the Moroccan settlers to be also given the right uh, uh, to, to 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 vote. We uh, ended up accepting the Baker's plan, the James Baker's plan in two thousand and three that gives you exactly the impression that Morocco on its own is not willing to cooperate in any solution whatsoever that solution. Because Baker's plan that was adopted by the Security Council in 2003 and was accepted the poli po by the Polisario Front consists in granting the territory and autonomy under the Moroccan sovereignty for a period between four to five years. That's one thing, under the Moroccan sovereignty. By the end of this period, a referendum of self-determination will be organized. And not only the Sahrawis will vote in that referendum of self-determination, but those Moroccan settlers that they can prove that, that they have been resident to the, in the territory prior to 1999 for a period of 12 years, uh, uh, conditions like that would also have the right to vote in that referendum. So for four or five years, it was largely enough for Morocco to lobby the hearts of the Sahrawi people. If really the choice of the autonomy or the integration was the best option of the Sahrawis. That is, Morocco has the right to win this plan because it has four or five years to lobby the hearts of the Sahrawi people and to convince them that the best option is to stay or to be a, a part of Morocco. If Morocco fails to get the uh, approval of the Sahrawi people, then still has another chance in the referendum of self-determination, where a big part of the Moroccan settlers will also have the right to, 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 to vote. Yet Morocco refused this, 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 uh, this, this, this plan. And this meant really a huge risk for us as the Polisario Front, vis-a-vis -vis even our national public opinion, but it was for the sake of facilitating the mission of the, of the United Nations. In 2007, we presented also a package of seven points as guarantees for Morocco in case the referendum of self-determination will lead to the independence. Those guarantees include massive regularization of the Moroccan settlers in the territory, giving them the Sahrawi nationality if the, if the referendum will, will, uh, will lead to the independence. Guarantees in terms of the security on the borders between Western Sahara and Morocco. But also, more importantly even, the possibility of the two countries for a joint exploitation of the natural resources of Western Sahara. We have been very conscious since, the, since day one that we have a part of the bill for peace that we have to pay. We have been very conscious of that, but Morocco was not ready to pay, not the, its part of the bill, not even to think about any, uh, uh, any, any, any way to cooperate, to settle the conflict peacefully. So this is basically the presentation that I wanted to share with you. And I will be very glad to to respond to any questions from you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the insightful presentation and uh, the whole overview of the whole conflict and the situation. Um, as I wrote in the chat, uh, if you want to ask questions, you can just raise your hand. You can use the button that is 
I think they changed the, the Zoom version. It's not under participants anymore, but it's under reactions where you can raise your hand. Uh, or at least on Mac, it's like that. It might be under participants if you if you have the older version or a different version. But you can just raise your hand and ask your question. If you don't want to actually uh, raise your hand and ask a question yourself, you can send it to me in the chat and I can ask the question for you. So while I wait for other people to say if they want to ask a question, I'd like to ask you a question uh, myself, which came up during uh, your your talk. And the question is about uh, the uh, Saharian people right now. What's their status in general? Like, are they considered uh, stateless people? Or are they, do they have Moroccan nationality? Uh, or do they have something in, in between? So yeah, that's my question. Uh, you're muted. Yes, yes. The Sahara is under Moroccan occupation. They are, because um, contrary to the case of Israel, for instance, Morocco doesn't recognize itself as an occupying power. For them, Western Sahara is Morocco. It's not like Israel is right to the occupied territories of Palestine. This led them to put in place a policy of uh, dealing with the Sahrawis as Moroccans. So for the Moroccan authorities, Western Sahara people under occupation are Moroccans as any other Moroccans. Of course, you would see that uh, in terms of um, they introduced some, some, uh, uh, some numbers and letters to, for the IDs of the Sahrawis that would make them different from the IDs for the rest of Moroccans. All they, they put SH, which is Sahara, sort of. Uh, but according to the law, to the Moroccan law, they are Moroccan citizens as any other Moroccan citizens. There is a growing movement inside the occupied territories to renounce the Moroccan IDs by the Sahrawi, uh, the Sahrawi uh, activists. But uh, 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 they are citizens uh, within a, a military occupied territory. And of course, when there is the fact uh, of the military occupation is established, the, the law that is to be implemented is the international humanitarian law and not the any any sort of other 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 laws. This is for the when, for the people under the Moroccan occupation. For the people in the refugee camps and in the liberated area are citizens of the SADR, Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic. That was declared by the Polisario Front in uh, 1976 because when Spain withdrew from the territory without properly decolonizing it, which means granting the people of the Western Sahara the right of self-determination, there was a legal vacuum left. There was an administering power that left without any proper of, um, transfer of power of the territory, a military invasion by Morocco and all of that. So the Polisario Front De declared the Sahrawi Republic as an independent uh, state. And since then, in the refugee camp and the liberated area, of course, the institutions of the Sahrawi Republic, we have our IDs, our passports, uh, uh, we enjoy all the rights, all you know, the normal rights of any citizen that belongs to an independent. This independent country is fully fledged member of the African Union. Uh, which is the continental organization recognized by the majority of the African countries, but also other countries in Latin America and 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 uh, and Asia. So, and we have embassies almost all over those uh, uh, continents. Of course, in Europe is a different uh, is a different case because the European countries they recognize the Polisario Front as the representative of the Sahrawi people, but they don't recognize the Sahrawi Republic as an independent. Uh, a state uh, uh, yet, but they don't recognize the Moroccan sovereignty over their territory either. So 
this is basically the status of the the of the of the Sahrawis under occupation or uh, in the refugee camps in on the uh, under liberated uh, under liberated area. Thank you very much. I'll now pass the torch to Nina, who has a question. Yeah, thank you very much also, first of all, for the presentation. And since now you've talked about the Sahrawi people, um, I was wondering about the Moroccan people, because I think you made the stance of Morocco towards uh, Western Sahara very clear. But I was wondering if that's something that only emanates from the Moroccan government in a sense, or is it something that's also widely shared among the Moroccan people? Is, uh, is in fact a good question because, uh, because the opinion of the Moroccan people matters for us. And we think that it has been silenced since the beginning until now. At the beginning of the conflict, there was a movement that declared publicly the opposition to the official thesis when it comes to Western Sahara. The leaders have been sentenced to uh, uh, almost to death by the, by the King uh, Hassan, and many of them spent uh, uh, 25 to 30 years in, 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 in prison. But from 1975 until now, because of the, of course, you know, the democracy in, <clears throat> and in Morocco and the freedom of speech and all of that and the limitations in that, uh, in that, in that sense. But the efforts by the official efforts uh, managed to uh, get only one point of view that transpired from the general uh, reality of Morocco. And that was the one that supports the official position of Morocco. That was during the, uh, especially for the last years. But since, I mean, especially since 2016 until now, with this um, a possibility, especially on the social media, the, uh, that the states, they don't have the monopoly anymore over the media and that the social media, the people they have been, they had the possibility to express themselves. We, we are gladly observing some of a, a, a growing expression by some Moroccan uh, uh, people of, uh, of uh, positions that ask for the respect of the right of the self-determination of the people of Western Sahara. And for them is a democratic choice and that if Morocco is sure about the, 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 about the rights and about the Sahrawis that they really want Morocco, let them uh, ratify this in the, in the, in the in a democratic vote in, in a referendum. And uh, now as we speak, uh, uh, many voices, many Moroccan voices have started expressing, expressing this, uh, expressing this uh, uh, vision. Yet the majority of the people that the regime wants to portray, they express exactly the same, the, the same, uh, the same vision as the, as the regime in, in place. But uh, what they call it unanimity, I mean, throughout history was not, uh, was not, um, uh, was not a, a parameter to, to confirm the legality of the, of, the, um, of the cause of the regime in place. Because we know that throughout history, people rallied behind some theses of the, uh, of the governments in place that they have been later on proved to be to be not only wrong to be criminal even so uh, so I, I just wanted also to to uh, to to make a special emphasis on 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 this but we are very open on very optimistic that the moroccan general public opinion will end up uh, uh, discovering the reality of the conflict and discovering that uh, uh, there is an international law and that uh, the UN uh, has uh, a say on this and that the right of the people of Western Sahara is the key word to settle this uh, conflict and that maintaining the conflict serves only the interests of the government in place 
and not necessarily really the interests of the people of Morocco. Because if you see the investment in the Moroccan army in Western Sahara, uh, the money that is invested there to sustain the occupation could have been invested in to improve the quality of life of Moroccans. And this is a story since 1975 until, uh, until, until now, especially that we have been very open to put in place a mechanism of cooperation between the two, uh, the two states in, in the case Morocco with respect our will to, to, to freedom and to independence. Thank you for the answer. I have a, actually a question that is kind of connected to that, to what uh, you just said, because I was wondering why you were talking about the goal right now is to have a second referendum, an actual referendum for the Saharawi people. And I was, uh, was wanted to ask you what should happen for Morocco to actually recognize it this time, if it happened again? what is like could for example the public opinion of morocco pushing towards it be one of the factors that could help the government of morocco actually recognize a referendum or is it or would it have to be for example an external power uh pressure from the from the un or from the west in general to actually push morocco and the regime the regime to to accept uh, any result of the referendum I think, as I said, only external power, especially the Security Council, could force Morocco to accept the referendum of self-determination. But at the same time, the Sahrawis, we are not going to remain with the... Uh, uh, we, we will assume our responsibility in resisting the occupation. And I think that the military action the diplomatic action and the resistance of the civil society under the Moroccan occupation, the three fronts at the same time combined would create a new reality, a new balance of powers between uh, the Sahrawi people and Morocco that may, um, may force Morocco. Of course, we will need all the time an external pressure on Morocco, but the combination between the, between the two things would may force Morocco really to accept the referendum of self determination because in 1991 it was not really the wish of Morocco it was not Morocco on its own that decided after fighting 15 years uh, against the Sahrawis in Western Sahara no that I have discovered now that Western Sahara is a non self governing territory and that a referendum of self determination should be organized no it was because of the resistance of the Sahrawi people and the fact that Morocco couldn't sustain any more the economic uh, uh, cost of the of, 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 of the war, but at the same time, uh, an international pressure uh, that came in, especially late uh, 90s and the beginning of the uh, late, 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 late 80s and the beginning of 90s. We are, we hope that maybe uh, uh, we will have a similar context in which Morocco would realize that the best option for everybody is to go ahead for the for the referendum and allow the democratic choice of the people of Western Sahara to prevail. Well, while I wait for other questions, I'll ask you another one, maybe a more personal one. And is it kind of also part of what you're doing as a representative of the uh, of the as a, an ambassador to, to the European Union, is it also part of your post to actually lobby towards like for these for the European Union and the, and the countries in the European Union to actually work and push Morocco towards a recognition of and to apply pressure? Or is it mainly a representation um, uh, post. We, 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 have, we have representations almost all over Europe. Polisario Front representations, including one in The Hague. And the mission of a Sahrawi representative is, of course, to 
lobby the public opinion and to try try to raise the profile of the conflict and try to inform the general public opinion about the plight uh, and the struggle of our people. That's one thing. And the other thing is to maintain a close contact with the ministries of foreign affairs in place and work with the parliaments, with the media, and try to get the recognition of the Polisario Front, and but also for the Sahrawi, uh, for the Sahrawi Republic. Uh, we have uh, been very close from getting the recognition of Sweden. As you know, uh, four or five years uh, ago, there was uh, there was uh, uh, a vote by the Parliament uh, unanimously that that uh, directed the government to proceed to the former recognition of the Sahrawi Republic. So that was an outcome of an ongoing effort for, uh, for years. So we are almost on the, same, on the same agenda. And in Brussels, we work, of course, uh, uh, towards, uh, uh, we work closely with the European Commission, the European Parliament. We have a very active European intergroup inside the European uh, European Parliament that advocates for the for the for the for the rights of the people of Western Sahara. So it's a complex mission that involves diplomatic actions, media actions, uh, public, uh, I mean, lobbying and and uh, and all of that. Thank you very much. Um, Emilia has a question, actually. Yes, thank you very much um, for your talk. Um, maybe this was kind of answered uh, throughout your lecture, um, but I was just wondering, what do you think, since more and more countries are recognizing um, the Western Sahara as a country um, in its own right, what do you think it would take for the UN to actually take an active stance to um, fight more for the rights of the people living there? Or what, what would be needed since would it be when 50% of UN countries support it? Or do you have a clear idea of what would be that, you know, cutoff point as to when the UN actually starts acting? Yeah, I think that in terms of recognizing the Sahara Republic or granting the Sahara Republic a status of member inside the United Nations, so that would, of course, the would require two thirds recognition by the countries and all of that. But we are not yet there. And that's, I mean, what we are asking is the settlement of the conflict in Western Sahara on the basis of the international law and the resolutions of the UN. Uh, it will be easier for the UN, instead of asking us to go to this very slow process of getting recognitions all over the world, to just uh, uh, organize the referendum of self-determination and force Morocco to abide by the international law, but to respect the promises that were that the promise that was given to the Sahrawis in 19, uh, 90, 1991. Uh, the Security Council was very passive on the issue because of the Moroccan pressure, because of the allies of Morocco inside the UN Security Council, especially France, but also among others. Uh, it is time really uh, for the UN Security Council to assume its full responsibility because the conflict. Uh, this time around may uh, bring with some regional complications because the region of Western Sahara, you know what is going on in the Sahel, and uh, you know that it is very cl very close to the European European uh, European borders. You know the uh, challenge of the immigration to the Canal Islands. You know to the potential of instability in the region and what is its impact on the Mediterranean as a whole. So it's a conflict that may start something and but end up some uh, end up really something more more serious. And uh, this is really time for the international community to be. To be proactive in in in, in uh, more proactive in uh, in uh, in speeding up the process. Um, and you hope that the more countries, especially countries active in the Security Council, recognize that danger and that it's becoming, you know, more and more of an issue. Um, that that will then lead the UN to actually, um, well, act more directly. Yeah, of course, because. I mean, I think that is the sense why, why we have decided to react on the Moroccan inv invasion of that part in, in last, last year. 
because in 2016, there was a Moroccan attempt to pave the road between the wall and the Mauritanian border, which was a clear violation of the terms of this ceasefire. Because the ceasefire, the uh, agreement number one stipulated very clear, very clear that none of the parties is meant to change the reality that was existing at the moment of the ratification of the agreement of the ceasefire. So paving the road between the military, the Moroccan military wall and the border with Mauritania, crossing the liberated area of Western Sahara was changing the reality. And we have been very close to engage in military, uh, uh, mi in military action against the Moroccan army in 2016. And we said very clearly to, to the UN General Secretary by then, uh, Ban Ki-moon, but also the Security Council, that the ceasefire is very fragile. And that maintaining the ceasefire, you need to invest seriously to speed up the political uh, uh, process. Instead, since the resignation of Kola in 2017, uh, 2018, they left the process almost one year and a half with no pilot in command, no special involved for one year and a half. So instead of really being aware and conscious of the seriousness of the reality in Western Sahara and the need that they, 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 they must do something, they left it with no special envoy for one year and a half. And of course, the outcome was the resumption of the armed struggle and the ceasefire that is no longer there with all the complications that will, will, will bring with. I think that the message now should be clear for everybody that uh, 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 um, another way to tackle the conflict should be undertaken by the Security Council, different from the one that was uh, uh, existing during the 30 years that failed for every, uh, it was very clear that because the objectives were, the objective was to settle the conflict. 30 years after the deployment of the UN mission, the conflict is, is, still, is still there. The Sahara is still, they are still suffering. No referendum of self-determination. Even on very basic issues like, self, like the rights, the, like the human rights of the people under occupation, inside the Security Council, they were not able to give a mandate for the UN mission to monitor the human rights in the territory because Morocco presented its veto against this. Because Morocco knows that once the Sahara is under occupation feel a sort of protection by the international community, a huge uprising will go on in the occupied territory. So uh, the MINURSU and the UN, no movement at all to accomplish their mission. No referendum, not on the issue of human rights, natural resources are still plundered of the territory exactly in front of the eyes of the UN. And uh, we have been there 30 years waiting for this. So for us, we have been left with no choice, but. Uh, Trying, uh, trying something else. Yes, definitely. Um, I had a question actually related to this. And do you think that actually the, also the, for example, the one year and a half vacancy of the, of the mandate of the, of the mission might have been a response to a like, consequence of the US position changing with the Trump administration and because you, you said in the lecture that the Trump administration actually brought, uh, like recognized uh, uh, Morocco sovereignty over, over Western Sahara. Why do you think that happened? Was it just a political push for the US to actually get Morocco to sign then the Abraham Accords and the recognition of Israel? Or was it an actual policy shift of the US and thus how, how did it affect Western Sahara and in general, the, the whole region? I, I think it, it, it comes within exactly the Abraham Accords. There is no doubt about that. It was the price uh, to be given to Morocco to normalize, to normalize with, uh, with, with, with Israel. That was very clear for everybody. Blinken, the new Secretary of State in his, in his first uh, uh, appearance in front of the, st the Senate said it, said it very clearly that uh, the incentives that were given to some of the four Arab countries that decided to normalize with Israel, especially that those that defy the international norms 
should be reconsidered. That was an explicit reference to the issue of Western Sahara. Because inside the US, the political class, some very uh, uh, prominent political personalities, all of them expressed some very uh, uh, firm uh, views to condemn the Trump in unilateral decision to recognize the Sahrawi, to recognize the Moroccan occupation or sovereignty over Western Sahara. Because the US was the, the pen holder inside the Security Council on Western Sahara. The US was the country that drafts all resolutions on Western Sahara. It has been granted that status because of a position that was adopting. That was that allowed us to be in a position where the two parties can at least uh, have a sort of trust in it. Now that position is no longer there because the US decided to recognize the Moroccan sovereignty. So if you decide to recognize the Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara, there is nothing left because the core of the issue is the final status of the territory. When you decide the final status of the territory that that belongs to Morocco, nothing is left to, to, to negotiate or to speak about. So that is one thing. And the other thing, the position was in contradiction with the with the some founding principles of the of the of the foreign policy of the US, especially the right of self-determination. You know that the President Wilson was the one that championed all, all of this. You have also the um, the uh, the 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 uh, prohibition of the acquisition of of uh, of, of territories with uh, with force that was also one of the founding principles of the of the foreign policy of the U.S. The two uh, principles were largely did, 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 largely violated by the by by Trump's uh, by Trump's uh, uh, proclamation, and then the U.N. Secretary General. The major allies of the U.S. all over the world, all of them denounced that uh, that, uh, that 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 proclamation. It came within a very narrow vision on Abraham uh, uh, Accords. Uh, yet Morocco even didn't didn't honor its engagement with with Trump uh, with Trump uh, with Trump uh, proclamation so far because we remember that in the in the in Trump's tweet. There was reference to fully, to full the establishment of full diplomatic relations between Morocco and Israel. Full means opening two embassies. That is that is one. Yet we didn't see any embassy, not in Rabat, not in in, in Tel Aviv. And of course, Moroccans they want to play with that to um, to uh, to to secure a sort of uh, continuation of the same stand with the Biden with the Biden uh, administration. But we said it from the uh, from the first day that uh, the decision wouldn't uh, alter the nature of the conflict in Western Sahara as a decolonization conflict. Wouldn't have any impact on the uh, uh, right of the people of Western Sahara to self-determination and would certainly have no impact at all on our determination to carry on with our struggle to uh, liberate our country. Thank you very much for the, um, for the explanation. Uh, are there any more questions? I haven't received any or uh, any in the chat or if you have any question, you can just raise your hand. If not, I'd say we can. I think we. I think uh, we can end here, the official part of the night and the lecture, and I'll give the floor back to Emilia. Well, thank you very much, Ellen, and thank you for giving a very insightful talk tonight. I have to say, I learned a lot. Very interesting, um, and I wish you a lot of luck in your uh, work and your endeavors. Um, I want to make a few final announcements. Um, firstly, that uh, today and tomorrow will be the last two days you can sign up to um, get a Sibylla, which is the SIP magazine. Um, so if you're a member, um, click on the link down below and you can order one. 
Um, and then for upcoming events, next week we will have a lecture also organized by the activities committee um, with the uh, special envoy or with the high commissioner of the UNHCR for the central Mediterranean situation, uh, which I'm also quite excited about. So I hope to see you all there again. And with that, um, thank you everybody for coming. Um, and I hope you have a good night and hope to see you soon again. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Just to be clear, it's the special envoy of the high commissioner. It's not the actual high commissioner. We tried the high commissioner, but he, he couldn't. <laughs>